Okay, it's Friday the 21st of February, and welcome to my weekly show, for want of a better word, where I just take a look at the certain feed that I have in my Twitter feed, certain list, as it were. Basically, generally, employment or legal issues, Irish legal issues, tweets perhaps of interest, and they may interest you. At the moment, it's a weekly type of a show, a weekly type of a look just at the various things that may have happened during the week that might be of interest to you if you're an employee or if you're an employer or you're in business. So I'm just looking, as I say, at my feed. I have a particular feed set up to uh, find legal tweets, and it's from various solicitors and uh, legal firms and so on. One of the one of them there I see is a breach of the transfer of undertakings regulations can result in an award of up to two years wages. That's the question of a transfer of an undertaking is the 2P regulations. There are various regulations and there are various breaches of the regulations. For example, failing to afford somebody the terms and conditions that they had prior to the transfer in the new uh, situation after the transfer or perhaps failing to notify and failing to discuss and failing to advise prior to that. So as I said, there's a number of different regulations. Each of them probably has a different remedy, a different level of compensation, but it is possible to be awarded up to two years wages for a breach of certain 2P regulations. There's a story there in the post or in the um, news as well, which obviously was on the news last night I saw where a lady sued a luxury hotel spa in County Kerry, I think it was the Muckross Park Hotel, after she contracted Legionnaire's disease. Apparently she suffered very serious injuries and she endured a three week induced coma and life changing injuries. She obviously sued, brought a claim against the hotel for negligence and uh, an apology was read out in court yesterday apparently when the case when it was announced that the case had been settled, but obviously as part of the settlement, uh, an apology was tendered to the lady in question, who was, I think, on a anniversary, a wedding anniversary trip to Muckross Park Hotel in Kerry. There's another tweet there about the WRC decision in the case of Anne Roper versus RTE. This is another one of those mandatory retirement cases where the employee was essentially forced to retire and brought a claim then for discrimination on the Employment Equality Act 1998 and I think uh, almost certainly she succeeded in her claim and these can be expensive claims for employers because it's an Equality Act, it's a disability or sorry a discrimination type claim and therefore the potential award is up to, um, up to two years salary. It's tax free as well. It's tax free incidentally because it is it's a discrimination claim. Uh, it's not uh, it's compensation for the act of discrimination and therefore it is seen to be uh, compensation for that act as opposed to wages or financial loss or pay. So an unfair dismissal claim, the compensation or the award for that is essentially pay or seen as pay or quasi pay and is therefore taxable. However, if you are successful with the discrimination claim, regardless of which ground of discrimination and there are nine grounds, then that particular award will be tax free. So it can be of significant benefit to you. There's a tweet there, it's just a timely reminder as it were in relation to constructive dismissal that an employee must show the views the internal grievance procedures before resigning and there's a review there by another solicitor of a recent case which confirms this. This is normally the situation and this is normally the advice that I would give employees when they come to me, that they must use the internal procedure first and they really must exhaust it. If they do that, then they can go along to the WRC and look uh, and say, look, I've behaved as a reasonable employee would. There's procedures in the workplace. I have availed of them. I've availed of the appeals procedure and I've been unsuccessful. Here I am in the WRC with clean hands, as it were. I've done my best, and now I want you to find in my favour. That's a tenable proposition for the WRC. 
However, if you go along having stropped off out of the job without availing of procedures that are available in the workplace, without availing of perhaps an appeals procedure, well then you're going to have a much more difficult time persuading the WRC that you have no choice but to leave the employment because it may even look in certain situations like a sort of a lifestyle choice and in that situation you're not going to win a claim for a constructive dismissal which of itself is difficult enough to win in any event because unlike unfair dismissal constructive dismissal places the burden of proof on the employee to show that there's no choice but to leave the job and the burden of proof resting with the employee is much more difficult to discharge than it is obviously if the employer has the burden of proof to show substantial grounds uh, as to why a dismissal took place. See another case there where uh, 15,000 euros was awarded to a store manager who was dismissed for hugging staff members um, and the reason that again the employer lost the case was of unfair procedures used by the employer. Again, this is something, a theme that comes up time and time again. The employer really should use fair procedures. Having said that, I have a case coming up myself in the not too distant future where the employer didn't use fair procedures, but I'm relying on a particular case or cases which are authority for the proposition that the employer doesn't have to behave perfectly and the uh, conduct of the employee and so on must be taken into account. So we'll see how I get on with that argument. I was involved in a case not too long ago as well where I was acting for the employee. Again, the procedures weren't the May West, weren't the best, but it may well be the case that the employer will still withstand our claim for unfair dismissal, even though the procedures weren't great, because the substantive issue or the substantive conduct which led to the dismissal of the employee may well see the adjudicator finding in favour of the employer and basically finding that the dismissal was justified and there were substantial grounds for it but we'll wait and see hopefully we won't uh, hopefully we will win there's a case there i'm going to take a look at i see a, a tweet from the law society about it it's a high court judgment in a case involving debtors and joint properties and it looks at the question of breaking up or splitting a joint tenancy, joint ownership, where one of the owners of the property may have creditors. What's the story in terms of severing or splitting the joint tenancy? How is the other the person, the other owner who may not owe any money, how are they affected and how is their interest in that particular property affected? That's something I'm going to look at this weekend. I'm going to do a blog post on it. I need to have a look at that particular blog post though and I need to look at the case itself to see exactly what is the story in relation to severing a joint tenancy. I have a feed here as well for Irish business but the quality of the tweets that come into it are not great to be honest with you. Um, there's business loans there available for Irish businesses and uh, there isn't too many tweets which are of interest or of value apart from my own of course which are very insightful and perspicacious. But I must say that the standard of tweets in the Irish business section or the Irish business list that I have are not great. And basically they are glorified ads, which is a bit unfortunate because I find myself in business when you're running a business and you're trying to get clients, the best way to do it is actually just to give out good information, good value in advance, and therefore people will come to know you and trust you and recognize that you actually have a fair old idea about what you're doing and are much more likely to go to you to engage your services rather than sending out tweets which are essentially advertisements and which essentially are saying buy my stuff it's not the most successful strategy hope you find this video useful if you do give it a thumbs up down below as I say, it's part of a weekly look at tweets to do with law generally and business as well. But the business tweets that are coming through there are crap, quite frankly. I'm going to have to have a look at that and see can I get half decent tweets uh, from a reliable source that might be useful. But what's coming through there at the moment in the way that I've set up that particular list are is very, very poor. So hope you find this video useful. If you do, give it a thumbs up down below. Thanks for your time.